Hi, I'm Jason Koo, and this is the first in a series of tutorials on drawing origami diagrams, produced for Origami USA's online magazine, The Fold. The Fold contains a variety of diagrams and other articles on origami for both members and non-members alike, so if you're interested in origami, it's worth a look. There are two types of graphics on a computer. The first is called raster graphics and is good for manipulating photographs and images at fixed sizes. Images are produced by specifying a color at each point on a pixel grid and can be created and modified using programs like Microsoft Paint and Adobe Photoshop. However, such images look bad when scaled up and making changes requires you to change each pixel one by one. Vector graphics, on the other hand, are both scalable and easy to modify. Instead of representing a line as a bunch of black pixels on a white background, for example, in vector graphics we represent a line by the location of its two endpoints. We don't really care how the computer interprets these vector locations, we just care that when we draw a line we can easily move it around and manipulate its style, color, etc. While there is a lot of software for producing vector graphics, there are two that really stand out. The first is Adobe Illustrator, which is really the industry standard, full of features but pretty expensive. Currently a license for Illustrator costs about $20 per month. The second is Inkscape, and Inkscape is open source and freely available. It doesn't have all the features of Illustrator, but it is improving every year. I'm going to try to look at both Illustrator and Inkscape in this series, but we'll be starting with Inkscape since it's free. Now, if you look on YouTube, there are already some videos on using Inkscape to draw origami diagrams, and many more tutorials on using Inkscape itself. While I will give a brief introduction to the software, I'm going to focus on the features that I find most useful for drawing origami-related diagrams and share some tricks and best practices that I've developed over the years. First, we'll need to download Inkscape from inkscape.org by choosing the appropriate operating system page in the download menu on their website. I'm using a Mac, so I choose the Mac OS X option. In this tutorial, we'll be using Inkscape 0.91, which is the same version across all platforms. Apple users will also need to download and install Xquartz, which is the windowing system that Inkscape runs in. After completing the installation on your machine, go ahead and open Inkscape. The first time you open Inkscape, it may take a while to load while it configures initial preferences. Once it opens, you'll see the Inkscape environment. We will be drawing on pages located on what is called the canvas in the center of the view. Around the canvas are useful menus and toolbars. Most commands can be accessed through the menu bar. The command bar right below it houses shortcuts to the most common global actions. The toolbox on the left holds the different tools you will use to draw and manipulate graphics. When a tool is selected, special tool-specific shortcuts are available in the Tool Controls bar. On the right is the Snap bar for configuring Snap preferences, and on the bottom is the Color Palette and the Status bar. There are a lot of options, but don't worry about them all for right now. Before we even start drawing, there are a few preferences that we'll want to change that will help us with diagramming origami. Now Inkscape has two different types of preferences. Preferences associated with the application and preferences associated with the document. First, let's modify the application preferences by going to Edit, Preferences, or by pressing the rightmost icon in the command bar. We're just going to make four small changes here. First, under the Tool category, change the bounding box from Visual to Geometric. The bounding box outlines the extent of a selected object. A geometric bounding box references the underlying geometry instead of object styles like stroke width that may change over time. Next, under the Node category, select Always Show Outline. Always showing outlines will make it easier to see selected geometry. Next, under Behavior, choose the Transforms category and deselect Scale Stroke Width. When diagramming, we'll want to use standard stroke widths, so when we transform objects, we won't want these stroke widths to change. Lastly, under the Steps category, we'll change the rotation snaps to every 22.5 degrees. This is typically the most convenient setting for origami. That's all we need to change here, so close that and open the Document Properties under the File menu or by clicking the second to last command bar icon. Notice that pixels are the default unit in Inkscape. 
there are 90 Inkscape pixels to one inch, but be careful. Other programs use a different default pixel size. For example, Illustrator uses 72 pixels per inch. I'll be diagramming for an American publication, so I'll change my page size to US letter. And then the last option to change is under the Snaps menu. Here, adjust the snap distance to 5. This will allow us to be more precise when using snaps. Snapping is really useful when drawing origami diagrams. Let's close out of the document properties and enable snaps. Here I'm turning on all of the snap options except for the ones involving bounding boxes. Now in order for us to start drawing, let's take a look at the toolbox. There are a lot of tools here, but for right now we'll only need five of them. The selector is the primary tool for moving and transforming objects. The node tool is used for manipulating endpoints. The zoom tool is used for navigation. The ellipse tool is used for drawing circles. And the pen tool is our main drawing tool used for making straight and curved lines. These tools are so useful, we will want to be able to change between them quickly using keyboard shortcuts. Press spacebar to access the selector tool. Press N to access the node tool. Press Z to access the zoom tool. Press E to access the ellipse tool. And press B to access the pen tool. You can find a full list of keyboard shortcuts on the Inkscape website. We'll start by making sure we can navigate around the canvas. To pan around the canvas, you can obviously use the scroll bars or possibly trackpad gestures if you have a trackpad, but the easiest way is to press and hold spacebar and move your mouse around. To zoom in and out, use the zoom tool. Click to zoom and shift click to zoom out. You can also click and drag an area to zoom into a specific selection. There are many keyboard shortcuts for zooming to standard zooms. I'm not going to go into all of them, but zooming to the page is particularly useful and you can access that by pressing 5. Now let's start drawing. The pen will be our drawing tool of choice for pretty much everything. Let's start by selecting the pen tool and clicking on the canvas. Clicking around creates a chain of line segments. To end the chain, just double click. Now let's modify the chain. We can see its bounding box, which means the chain is selected. To move the chain, use the selector tool, press on it, and drag. We can manipulate the individual nodes of the chain by using the node tool. While we can access the node tool by pressing N, we can also access it by double-clicking the chain with the selector tool. The cursor changes, and the nodes of the chain become highlighted. Click and drag to modify the chain. Much of the time, we won't want our line segments to be connected since we might want to give each segment a different style, for example, mountain or valley. So let's get rid of the chain by selecting the chain and pressing delete. To demonstrate the key aspects of drawing in Inkscape, we will draw the crease pattern for a traditional crane. We'll start by drawing a simple square. There are many ways to do this in Inkscape, but we will do this by constructing four equal length line segments at right angles to one another. First, we'll draw one of the horizontal sides. With the pen tool, click one endpoint somewhere. If we hold down the control key, we'll notice that the line is constrained to multiples of 22.5 degrees, ensuring that we are drawing lines at the correct angles. This is one of the options we selected in the preferences. Holding down the control key, double click to the right to complete the segment. One side done. No more drawing for the rest of the square. Instead, we will construct the remaining three sides by transforming copies of this segment. With the segment selected, we can copy and paste objects by pressing Ctrl-C and Ctrl-V respectively. However, most of the time, we will want to just duplicate geometry in the same location, which we can do by pressing Ctrl-D. Move the copy away from the original and rotate it 90 degrees by clicking either rotate icon in the selector tool control bar. One rotates clockwise while the other rotates counterclockwise. Then drag the segment to the right of the other segment until it snaps into place. Snapping is really precise. If we zoom in on the connection, it looks like the two lines meet up pretty well, though the line strokes make it difficult to be sure. When we only want to look at the underlying geometry of our drawing and ignore line styles, we can switch over to Outline View. Click View, Display Mode, and then Outline. The line styles go away, and we see that, in fact, the lines match up perfectly. Outline mode can be great for checking the precision of your drawing, but we will stay in normal mode most of the time. We can continue the same process to construct the last remaining two sides, duplicating, rotating, and then snapping. Our square is complete. Now let's draw a bird base inside this square. First, we draw the two diagonals by snapping to the corners. 
Then we draw the horizontal and vertical halves by snapping to midpoints, holding down the control key to make sure the lines are perpendicular. The pedal fold crease lines are easily drawn also by holding down the control key. We can actually draw two of these diagonal creases at once, but these segments will then be connected. We can split this chain into two segments by selecting the middle node with the node tool and breaking the path apart by selecting the shortcut in the node tools control bar. Now they are separate lines, but they are still in the same path. We can break them apart by choosing break apart in the path menu. Of course, we don't have to draw the rest of the creases since they are symmetric to the ones we just drew. We can instead duplicate and rotate the existing creases and snap them into place. Here we've drawn a bird base crease pattern with all four corners folded together. However, to fold the crane, two flaps are folded up to form the wings. We can draw additional lines and use the node tool to modify the existing creases. Folding the traditional crane further thins the head and tail by bisecting those flaps with a kite fold. Here I'll talk about two good methods for accurately constructing angle bisectors using Inkscape. Both methods involve constructing an isosceles triangle from the angle to be bisected. In the first method, we construct a circle centered at the angle's vertex using the ellipse tool. Click on the vertex while holding down Shift and Control. Shift tells the ellipse to be centered at the starting click, while Control forces the ellipse into a circle. It is important that the circle intersect the two sides of the angle being divided. The circle we just drew has a red fill color, which is a little distracting. We can change the visual style of objects using the fill and stroke dialog, accessible from the object menu or the command bar. This dialog will be useful for changing stroke widths and dash types later on, but for now, we will just use it to remove the fill on this circle by pressing the X. With our circle in place, we will draw a line between the circle's intersection points. Rotating this line 90 degrees splits the angle in half along its angle bisector. Now we would like the line to extend further than it does now, and we can use the selector tool to scale it appropriately. But when we scale the segment, we will want to keep its stroke width the same. Thus we will turn off stroke width scaling in the selector's tool control bar. Selecting the bisector, we can now expand it collinearly by dragging a corner while holding down the control key using snapping to guide its final location. Alternatively, we do not need to use the ellipse tool at all. Instead, we can duplicate and rotate the angle's shorter side onto the other. To rotate about a specific axis, we can select the segment with the selector tool and click on it again. This will change the corner icons to rotation arrows with a crosshair at the center. To change the rotation axis, drag the crosshair to the angle's vertex and then drag a rotation arrow until the side snaps onto the other. Using the node tool, we'll move the vertex endpoint to the starting location, and then rotating this segment by 90 degrees also results in an angle bisector. Scaling, duplicating, reflecting, and trimming finishes one quadrant. We could repeat this process three more times, but we can duplicate these creases faster by grouping them together, pressing Ctrl G while they are selected. Groups stay together until they are ungrouped by pressing shift Control g Duplication, rotation, and reflection complete the remaining sides. Now for the reverse folds. The position and angle of the reverse folds for the head and the tail of the crane may be different from person to person. But for any angle, the creases corresponding to the reverse folds will reflect across existing creases in the crease pattern. Like angle bisection, reflection is another common procedure in origami diagramming we'll look at two different ways for reflecting lines. Let's concentrate on the head reverse fold. We can mark the reverse fold as an arbitrary line crossing one of the layers, which will then also be folded through all the other layers. All we need to do is reflect this line across each existing crease. To reflect a single line segment, our first method duplicates the reflection line and rotates it 90 degrees, snapping one end to the segment we want to reflect. Constructing a segment to the reflection line, duplicating it across the reflection line, allows us to reconstruct the reflection. Alternatively, as a method to reflect more objects, duplicate them together in a group along with the reflection axis. Mirror the group using one of the selector shortcuts, snap the two ends of the reflection line copies together, and rotate until one of them lies on top of the other. A few more reflections, and the crease pattern is complete. 
Using snaps and careful transformations, we can construct very precise drawings. Again, we can check the precision of our drawings in outline mode. This concludes our first tutorial on vector drawing for origami. Knowing how to draw lines accurately is the foundation of drawing origami crease patterns. Join me next time, where we will focus on line styles and drawing origami diagrams with multiple layers.